Hello, David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. Now, you probably know that I've been doing a series of things called The Bond Community, where I find people within the Bond community, influencers, people that have connected to the larger community. I've, quite frankly, emulated them and admired them for many, many years, and I'm, I'm trying to introduce them to the rest of the world, although probably the world knows them. And I'm joined today by somebody I've long admired, Mark O'Connell. Mark, thanks for joining us. Hi, hello, how are you doing? I long admired, good, I want to hear that, That's, yeah. Right, right, there'll, there'll be a lot of gushing and compliments. Long admired, long admired, that is good, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, a part of it is um, I, I've known about and of Mark and I've connected lightly, but um, Mark did something very special that I think a lot of us wish that we could do, and that is you wrote a book, and uh, this is the book right here, and Talk to us about catching bullets. What is this? I'll take the book from you and do that. Look at the yeah, technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a book about all our childhoods. That sounds like a horrible back cover blur, but it's a book about growing up with Bond, finding cinema and, and life through Bond, which I think a lot of us can identify with. But it's also, there's a backdrop that Bond was in my family before, well, before I was. And uh, my grandfather worked with the Broccoli family for well over 30 years. and. Names like Roger and Barbara and Pinewood were always sort of touted and I could always overhear them and I wasn't quite sure why. And then my father took me to see Octopussy, June 1983. I wanted to see Return of the Jedi. I kicked off and had quite a sort of meltdown in the, the cinema lobby. Um, but then I just fell in love with this man called Roger Moore and James Bond. So, so it's a book about all of our Bond childhoods and our Bond adulthoods as well. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things, I mean, I I was hoping and, and you, you fulfilled that hope that it wasn't, and it's not to put these down, but I was hoping it wasn't just another book giving me a synopsis of every movie. And yeah. and they're, they're out there and some get very detailed and very behind the scenes of the movies, which I appreciate. But to me, this was very different because, and I think I reached out to you, it was almost like you watched my childhood and not in a creepy manner, but in the manner of like my childhood was about finding artifacts. You know, I would watch a Star Wars film and I'd, I'd find a figure at J.C. Penney's and suddenly I captured a moment of that film. And same with James Bond, I would I would get a sticker, a Moonraker sticker. And when I read that you on, on the playground found these stickers and, and pogs and things like that, and it was finding like the holy grail for you and it really set you on a particular path, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was lucky. I mean, yes, I had all that. The uh, I remember View Took Kills sort of in the run up to the June release of that in 1985 over here. There was crisp packets where if you collected enough of the tokens that you had to cut out the greasy sort of uh, chip packet and uh, you could send off and get a View to a Kill poster. So that was like I was literally going into hedges and rivers and streams trying to look for old uh, potato chip packets but I was slightly lucky well I was very lucky I would get fed this stuff from my grandfather worked for Eon so I would get fed like uh, the teaser posters the uh, teaser albums and I've got one or two vinyl teasers which are like sort of industry tasters um, and I, so I've got all that stuff as well and I would I would sit in awe I remember my grandfather got me the View to Kill uh, Paris poster, the, the purple teaser, and it, it was above my bed for a, at least 15 years. I remember looking at it, and I, I've actually never been to Paris properly, which is horrific, because it is sort of the nearest city to where I am in London here. Um, and I've always wanted to go to those little streets and those little green bits on the uh, poster. So I had, I had the same things, but they would sometimes come from different sources and maybe maybe a bit earlier than others, but that wonder was still there. And my bedroom became like this Sistine Chapel of broccoli frescoes, I would say, with all these Roger Moore, Maud Adams, Few Eyes Only artwork. Yeah, I think it's interesting when I was reading it, um, uh, I'm in marketing. So in marketing, nostalgia is such an incredible thing because it has an emotional base. You can smell nostalgia, you could taste it, you can obviously see it. And one of the things I noticed when I read the book is that there really is a tipping point for you when you went from, oh, you know, uh, grandfather, you know, works for this company that I, I get some posters and I love James Bond to realizing the enormity of his connection and their, therefore your connection by proximity to Eon, what, what was that like? I, do you know what, right, I'm just, just between us because no one else is seeing this, no. uh, it hasn't really sunk in and I, nor do I want it to, so I'm just sort of deeply appreciative of it. Uh, 
Barbara particularly has been very kind and uh, a great sort of force and someone we um, connect with now and then. And I, I love her for that. So it, uh, it's but it hasn't quite sunk in. It, it, it didn't. It certainly didn't sink in when I saw um, Octopussy in June '83, and my dad tried to explain that my grandfather was involved in it. And I remember looking for his name on the opening titles, but they weren't there. So I was sort of said, "You're lying. That's not true." But, um, but possibly when we went to the f when when I went to the first Crew Eon screening of The Living Daylights, which was just before the uh, royal premiere here in London at Leicester Square, I remember just seeing this basically the size of the cinema. If that made sense, the, the, yeah. it, you know, the Odeon Leicester Square is a massive auditorium, a great cathedral of movies. And I was just like, OK, this is big. And also seeing the tickets hanging out of my dad's uh, dashboard on his car. And that suddenly made me realise. So it was, it was weird little side things like right. that. Mm. So and then also when I was an adult, also just seeing pictures. Even now I've got the, the James Bond archives book up there and I was I was actually in Berlin just flicking through it for some reason. And I just saw a picture of my grandfather and that's those sort of moments like, oh, OK, right. These are part of, you know, the Bond family photos. And that's nice that he's in there. Um, so it's sort of it hasn't fully sunk in. I don't want it to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just weird little moments just caught me at the scale of this. I'm going to edit that whole thing out. Nobody saw this. No, of course, we're going to leave it in. Yeah. We're going to be a glutton for punishment. Yeah. Uh, but but there was, you know, I, I can't help but think, and I don't know if the book answered this, so I, I personally wanted to ask you this. It, clearly, this was a passion project. What, uh, what some people don't realize is that you are a comedy writer. You're a writer for a living. That's how you, you know, pay for the paint and the couch in back of you. But, yeah, it's new yellow paint. Yeah. You know, I could tell, and, and thank you for doing that for us. We're going to all appreciate that. Yeah. I'm dying fumes here for this. But, <laughs> great. But, but there had to be some moment before 2012 uh, when the book was released where you said, you know something, there's an itch, excuse me, yeah. pun, but I need to scratch it, and the only way to scratch it is to write this book. What, what was that like? I know what that itch was, and it, it came from fandom. It came from being part of a Bond... I was part of one or two forums online in that early era of, of online fandom. And it, you know, guess what? It was as divisive and as angry and as brilliantly informed and misinformed as we see it now. Uh, but I was writing little sort of reviews because one of the things I do in Catching Bullets is I reappraise the movies. I want to re reframe them, revisit them. Um, I, like you say, I don't want it to be a list of gadgets and we all know that that film's rubbish and that that actress is bad. No, no, no. I want to, I want to say, is it really that bad? You know, they are only James Bond films. They're not meant to be big political uh, statements. And I was doing these reviews online and getting quite good traffic and hit rates or, uh, you know, uh, for the time. And I, I stupidly thought, wow, if everyone paid a dollar or 50 pence, I could be laughing here. It doesn't work like that, sadly. But it just made me think maybe there's a book here and a few people nudged and suggested there is a book, definitely. And then I, I resisted from the, you know, the, the the uh, the broccoli in the room literally I didn't want to pull in my grandfather and all of that because I felt you know he never betrayed any confidences when he worked for Cubby and Eon so I didn't want to be the first O'Connell to sort of confuse and uh, make Eon angry um, so I just thought I'm going to do it and um, I wanted to do a book that looked at fandom from the well, from all our fandoms, there's very few of us uh, who are below 40 who saw these movies in the order they've come out. I mean, there are probably great new fans now that have bought their new box sets and are doing it diligently. And that's great. And I, I would love to see those films in that order. But I didn't. I came to them in different orders. I started with Octopussy, then did uh, uh, View to Kill, Moonraker, then Thunderball. It was all back and forth based on right. what was being broadcast on British TV at the time. So I thought, actually because we have books about the making of Bond films. We have uh, sure. books looking at all of that. And I, want, I didn't want to do a biography of making Bond films. I wanted to do a biography of, of watching them. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I loved about it is the moments. And, and for those who haven't picked it up, I think you'll enjoy it because you really were very descriptive in the moments of everything around you. For example, when you were um, in a religious class and you're desperately trying to close everything off so you can get back to a particular advert or particular show or or yeah. even when you were on a class trip and finding that special artifact of, of just a simple guy that focused on Roger Moore, it really is the hunt and it was part of like your passion moving it forward. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I've got a weird 
memory. I'm an only child, so maybe I just took in more because it was just me. I don't know. Um, so I do sort of look at, I do remember too much, way too much. And also, you know, the internet and calendars are our friend and you can piece it together and work it out. Um, but yeah, I, I had that. I remember going on a Cub Scout trip where we were all camping and it got really rained out. It was like horrific British weather. And um, they gave us a treat of going into a local uh, uh, high street and shopping mall to buy what we wanted. And I was just looking for the local TV guide because I knew it had Roger Moore on the cover. And yeah, so all these other Cub Scouts are buying footballs and tennis rackets and sports shirts. And I'm buying a TV guide with Roger Moore on it. And I have no problem with that. I loved it. And I'm not going to tell um, the viewers out there how that particular story ends, but it's such a great ending of mm. how you do finally get it. But, but let's not tell them. They have to read the book yeah. to do that. You know, let's talk about finding things, because one of the things that, you know, people find is obviously a connection of you to that book. But I have personally found, I know others have, your online personality, the way you've you've taken Facebook and manipulated it to, to be visual as well as articles. Mm. What what did the what was the push to kind of say, all right, I've got to be kind of a, a social media connection as well? Yeah, um, I, 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 I like talking about cinema. I like sharing thoughts about cinema and sharing different thoughts. And some of those thoughts can be visual. Bond is such a, a visual, you know, juggernaut, whether it's the poster or the costumes or the title designs or or, or the look of a location. Everyone's clamoring for images and visuals so i often i'm also a frustrated movie poster designer i if i'm in the next life i'm coming back as um drew struzan because uh, <laughs> i've had enough of this itch that i keep trying to scratch but i'm just trying to make just different visuals because also for me as a writer you you're trying to create stuff that's just different and yes. there's any of us can share a picture of jane seymour you know tied up in live and let die or or roger moore you know in a safari suit and we do and it's great that we do but I just wanted to try and find some new content, often linked to the book. It, you know, it's not always, I don't do it as a selling tool. It's just that that's my sort of, I call myself the bullet catcher. That's my, um, that's my persona non grata, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting you say that. Um, I don't hold it against people, for example, on Instagram, when people kind of repost the same Daniel Craig pictures over and over. Um, and you know what? They have a lot of followers because people just like to see that. But when I see somebody with unique content, I immediately engage with them. So I think people are in social media analyzing the type of engagement versus mm -hmm. that quick hit like of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. dopamine that goes on in your head. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I, I'm a fan as well. I enjoy doing it. And it's such a visual medium on you know, social media and people do respond to visuals more. Um, so that's sort of what I do. But I also just, you know, I'm a fan and I celebrate Bond. For me, Bond is a good thing. It's Bond is my box of chocolates or my beer at the end of the day. It's it's well, it, I always say it's like my home and sense of family as well. I'm always yes. glad to come home. Um, so I don't want to just sit and rant and, and, you know, some fans get really upset and and crazed about, you know, delays or this film's not coming out or that they didn't know what they were doing there. I'm like, let's just celebrate it. You know, there's yes. there's. No one sets out to make a bad film. There's never been a wholly bad Bond movie. Um, so let's just celebrate it and be positive because right now, you know, in 2019, it's quite an unpositive world. So that's that's also what I try. I just try and give it a spin of calm down, relax. This is fine. It's cinema. Cinema does this. Bond is your home. And sometimes when you invite people into your home for a party, some people show up that you didn't quite expect, uh, positive and negative. Um, I wanna ask you two questions and I'm gonna ask the negative side of it first, but I swear to God, I'm gonna uh, lead with it uh, with a positive. Let's talk about the audience. Let's talk about the Bond community. What are those things that absolutely irritate you in the Bond community? Oh, how long have we got? No, that's not, <laughs> don't, don't wind up some of your audiences. Um, impatience. Uh, a lack of just uh, a lack of understanding of how art works, not just movies and big mainstream movies, but, you know, art takes time. Uh, some, you know, a Bond film takes time. If there's a delay, no one wanted that delay, but those delays are part of the process, part of the challenges to navigate. So perhaps fans impatience um, and with that impatience comes a slight prickly uh, anger about certain personalities, certain 
contributors, certain creatives, and it's it's always so unfounded. One of the things that really bugs me at the moment, and this is just me personally, obviously I'm I'm always Team Eon, definitely. But one of the things is, oh, we've had delays with Bond because they've been making other films and other stage shows, and that's 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 not the case. No, no, that everything that Eon have done with their um, with their independent movies of recent times and the new stuff coming up, it enhances Bond. It it feeds into it, you know, creatively. You know, um, making a movie or making anything like that is about collaborations. It's about partnership. Yeah. So when you know Barbara is working with uh, Annette Benning or the same uh, costume designer on uh, Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool, that is only benefiting Bond and that that the House of Bond. I, I call it. It's like one of the sort of the House of Versace. I was called the House of Bond. So that that bugs me a bit. And also this assumption that we all know. Oh, a, B and C film, we all know they're terrible. I'm like, no. no. Right. One of my favourite Bond films uh, is is A View to a Kill for very personal reasons. My grandfather's sort of a, not literally, but he's like a support character or a shadow in that film. And um, I, I can see its faults, but it's a great you know, 80s movie and people just assume it's terrible. And then they sort of look at you like, really? Um, so that bugs me, but that's fandom because we, we love our little lines in the sand mm -hmm. and we can't Cross the streams, whether we're Ghostbusters or or Sean Connery fans. I like that. Um, all right, so let's flip the coin a little bit. What do you absolutely adore and love about the Bond community? That I can talk to you. You're in America. I'm in London. That we that there's this oh, community. Hold on, we just froze again. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry about that. We yeah, yeah. lost. All right, we're back. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I I love the fact that we're just talking here and now. That's that's a great thing that the Bond fan, the Bond community, and the fandom, uh, you know, is en enabled by um, social media. We can reach out and and share things across the globe. Um, that's what I like, and I like the, I do like the sense of shorthand. You can talk to a Bond fan, and you always have that slight embarrassment or slight awkwardness <laughs> about yeah, yeah. I quite like that really bad. You know, moment or I really like that song that no one else likes. And you realise there's someone else that really likes that song that no one else likes. So it's 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 full of surprises. And I I, I actually think I've I've done another book recently looking at Spielberg and Star Wars, and I I actually enjoy the Bond fan community a little more, perhaps because I've had longer associations with it. Yeah. Um, but I, I I think with Bond, you probably had this with other franchises, but Bond you can be into the costumes, the clothing, the lifestyle. The music, yeah. uh, the locations. People love doing the location hunting. Um, for me, it's just how does it work as a piece of cinema? What is it tapping into now, and what, what are its sort of references? And is it fun? And every Bond film has been so far. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting you say it like that because I actually do feel the Bond fandom as a community has improved over time. And I mean, you, you're talking about factions. I remember there was a time not too long ago when you had the literary Bond people, you had the movie Bond people, you had um, you had the costuming and the Bond lifestyle people and never the two shall meet. You know, there wasn't a lot of integration. Nowadays, I see more and more collaboration, uh, conversation, you know, jumping over the fence to each other in a very positive way. So I think it's moving in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it's been, um, you know, uh, emancipated by social media. It, it, so I always think social media is a great thing in that way of globalization. I think it's a great thing because we're all just able to talk and communicate and share things instantly or not instantly. Um, right. Yeah, I think it's all good. Was there, um, some people have this, some people don't. Was there a moment in time when you suddenly realized, oh my gosh, this whole idea of being an influencer, which we should definitely liberally put it in quotes, um, I am affecting other people. Other people are listening to me. They're watching what I'm doing. I'm connecting with them. And I'm not saying it in a negative way. It could be very mm. positive, but you are reaching a wider audience. Was there kind of a tipping point for that? Um, no, no, not at all. You, no, no, I, I um, how do you mean tipping points? That's maybe what I, we'll oh, uh, was there, was there an event or something where you realize, oh my gosh, this isn't just for me in a small audience. This is really reaching far and wide globally. Yeah, when people take photos of my of watching skies on various beaches in Jamaica and Paris and France, I'm like, oh, okay. You sort of, even though you write a book, you have this naive assumption someone will buy it and some family people and maybe a film fan, but you forget, you know, it, anyone can buy it and a lot of 
you know, a lot of people have. So that's always slightly strange. And then you, you do have that feeling of responsibility. Like, oh, did, was I a bit critical of that film or that moment? Uh, I hope I wasn't. And I've, I've apologized to a couple of people responsible for those moments. And they've always said, no, no, you were, you were actually rather kind. Well, oh, OK, right. Wow. But yeah, 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 I'm not going to say what it is. Um, yeah, well, it's not enough. <laughs> I think you say that in the book too. So uh, yeah, yeah. Not, not, not well hidden. And by the way, I am guilty. I'm one of the individuals that have taken and posted on social media uh, pictures of me reading your book at different locations, my study out in the wild. Uh, it, no, it's, I love it's it. very natural. No, I love it. I love seeing it's, I mean, it is like when you write a book, it is like your child and it's, it's great, but slight, it's still now slightly scary to see my child has now, you know, gone to prom without me, has moved into a dormitory without me. It's it's having, my book's having his or her life out there. And it's, yeah, I now know what it's like to be a parent seeing you sort of kids, you know, clutching drinks at the other side of the world. Cause my, that's what my book ends up doing. And I love it for that. Well, it's, it's funny because you have a book, but at the end of this book, you have a, you have a very interesting treatment about your life and, you know, if Daniel Craig was a part of it, et cetera. Um, so do you, as an individual, have a, um, I'm just going to ask, a, a kind of a movie treatment or a script somewhere up here that you would love to unlock? For Bond? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've joked. I've joked to Barbara and a few others, you know, if you're hitting that little writer's block, you know, not that they do, but I, you know, I'm putting my hand in there. I'm always doing it as a joke. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the hardest things to do. I did try and just have a go just to sort of get out of my system uh and it's it, it you suddenly hit all the problems that any writer no matter their level will hit with bond and it's working out where are the dangers now how can they be manifested in a plan and a villain and getting that bit is quite tricky um but i had a great title or i have a great title um barbara knows what it is she, she hasn't used it yet but um no no she <laughs> But um, yeah, I've I've had a go. I've I've tried my chances. Yes, you have. Yeah, and, and like like you, you mentioned uh, you're first and foremost a fan. Everything else trickles down. I think I feel the same way. Yeah. Um, as fans, sooner or later, hopefully sooner, we're going to be treated to some news around Bond twenty five. What what's your expectation? What are your hopes for what we're about to be given? I my hopes are very high. High. I think it's going to be a Great little uh, beat in the Bond timeline. It's, that, it's Daniel Craig's final Bond film. Um, yeah. We've not really had that before. We obviously, we've had actors do their final film and maybe suggest they're done with the role during production. But this is the first time where amicably and positively, perhaps, um, we're going into a new Bond and the actors, it's his final role. And I, I feel I saw it a little bit, perhaps in The Elliot Twice and maybe some of the later Brosnans, that there is a lightness of touch when the actors perhaps reach the end of the line, there's less to prove mm. to the character, to the audience, and they, they enjoy it more. So I, I feel we might have a lighter Bond film, especially in light of, you know, everything that's happening in the world. I, I don't think Bond's going to reflect that deeply. I think he'll acknowledge it. Um, but I think we're going to have a lighter film and also a younger feeling movie, possibly. Uh, Kerry Fukunaga is a, a very vibrant, socially minded Netflix generation director. Mm. Um, he's the first 80s kid who's done Bond. He's the first yeah. Netflix kid. Uh, I think Bond and Daniel Craig, they're, they're going to honour Daniel Craig's last Bond film with a lot of cute bells and whistles. So that's what I'm looking forward to. That's fantastic. I I can't even add anything to that because I think that's perfect. I mean, that, that kind of balancing act of lightness to touch, but also kind of giving us what we're craving. That's pretty much spot on. So, yeah. yeah and also to see a Bond film... It, the biggest challenge when they write and create and shape a Bond film is where is Bond's role now? And I, you know, we've had a tumultuous three years at least, I yeah. made it, you know, in America and in Europe. So I'm curious to see how Bond will address that. And I, I imagine he won't address it politically and physically, but he might just flick it away in terms of tone. And that's, yeah, I just want to see Bond. I want to see the 2020 Bond film. Yeah, yeah. You and me both. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Last question. And it's all about you. Um, what's what's the future hold for you? I mean, what is your vision? Is it doing part part two of Catching Bullets, uh, being hit by shrapnel? I mean, what yeah. what do you envision you would like to do moving things forward? 
Well, I've got this book about ja- German hairstyles in the 80s called Matching Mullets. That's no, I'm joking. That's, that's my stock response on that one. Um, well, I have done a prequel sequel to uh, Catching Bullets, which is Watching oh. Spies, which is not about Bond, but it does answer a few what happened next in terms of with Roger Moore and Maud Adams, because the whole Catching Bullets has got this whole through line about pretending to be in love with Maud Adams for different reasons, then slightly being in love with her because she's such a, a cracking, stunning uh, person. And after the book came out, a few sort of wish wishes were granted and we had, I ended up having a great time with Maud. And um, yeah, I so so, there's, so I have sort of addressed that, that, but there's I'd like, I think there's another Bond book in my mind uh, once it works through. I'd also like to do, in fact, I'm working on something now, which is a, a third part of my cinema trilogy, but not what anyone would expect. It's not, it's not, um, yeah, it's not in the mold of the last two. That's fantastic. I, well, I'm looking forward to it. Seriously, I, oh, I said you. when you and I first started talking about this on the phone and even through email and other lovely channels um, that I was a fan, I was a follower. And I, I'll tell you, if, if people are enthralled by this conversation, it's one thing to connect with the book, but I mean, you've got, you're on Instagram. You're you're Mark O'Connell writer. I mean, that's literally what it what it's called. Yeah. And then obviously uh, Facebook, uh, Catching Bullets, uh, Memoirs of a Bond fan as well. Are there any other channels or outlets that people can connect with you? Um, I'm on MySpace. That's a new thing. I'm getting on MySpace now. No, um, no, uh, just Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr. <laughs> Tumblr sometimes, Pinterest, all the slightly distant cousin ones that we don't invite around anymore when we do our social media bits. But I'm, yeah, I'm on the, the usual corridors of social media. Fantastic. Mark, I cannot thank you for the time today. Uh, this has been good. I know that we're, uh, we're a little split apart, literally, um, right now, but I'm hoping that our paths cross quite a few times this coming year. Yeah, who knows? Who knows what, uh, what missions we'll end up We'll be jumping out the same airplanes, I'm sure, with, without parachutes. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this oh. has been David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience, and we'll see you all very soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from The Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information, plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you, just because we know you. Talk to you soon.